We continue on with the year 209 BC. In the last lecture, we covered the events in Iberia that led to the capture of New Carthage. This was a result of Scipio's bold moves, but also petty rivalries between the Carthaginian commanders in Iberia didn't help the situation. The Punic generals in Iberia were something of an enigma. They were capable of brilliant campaigns such as when they defeated the Scipio brothers, but more often than not they made serious errors in judgment such as their lack of foresight in defending New Carthage. The loss of New Carthage only added to the pressure mounting on Hannibal. The Romans had taken Capua, all of Sicily, and now New Carthage, and still the Carthaginian Senate made little to no attempt to resupply Hannibal in Italy. Instead, the Carthaginian Senate in previous years had dispatched reinforcements to Iberia and Sicily. And what did the Senate have to show for all of this effort? Sicily was now hopelessly lost, and Iberia, which had been on the cusp of falling to Carthage, was now back in play for the Romans after Scipio's victory. And so the situation was becoming increasingly perilous for Hannibal. In addition, the lack of reinforcements made it nearly impossible for Hannibal to replace soldiers lost in action, while Rome seemed to have an endless supply of troops. And yet Hannibal made no plans to abandon his campaign. He knew the only hope for winning the war outright rested solely in Italy, and for their part the Romans were still unwilling to offer up any large-scale battles to Hannibal. Now as I mentioned before, Fabius and Fulvius were elected consuls for the year 209 BC, and as the summer campaign season approached, the consuls began to make plans in close consultation with the Roman Senate. The main objective would be Tarentum. If the Romans were able to recapture Tarentum, this would put Hannibal's entire position in the south at risk. While still in Rome, both of the Roman consuls raised new legions. In addition, two legions were ordered back from Sicily in order to put more pressure on Hannibal. Marcellus would also retain his command of the legions in Apulia. Crispinus was assigned to two legions in Campania and was given the title of praetor. Valerius Lavinus retained his command in Sicily as a proconsul. The Romans would field a total of 21 legions for the summer campaign in 209 BC. It was around this time that some of Rome's Latin allies refused to supply their yearly quotas of soldiers. Livy writes, quote, Meetings were held amongst the Latins in the allied communities in which they complained loudly that for 10 years they had been drained by the levies and war taxes. Every year they fought only to sustain a great defeat. Those who were not killed in battle were carried off by sickness. A fellow citizen who enlisted by the Romans was more lost to them than one who had been made prisoner by the Carthaginians, for the latter was sent to his home without ransom. The former was sent out of Italy, into which was really exile, rather than military service. If the old soldiers were not to return, and fresh ones were always being enlisted, there would soon be nobody left. They would be compelled, therefore, before they reached the last stage of depopulation and famine, to refuse to roam what the necessities of their situation would very soon make it impossible to grant. If the Romans saw that this was the unanimous determination of their allies, they would assuredly begin to think about making peace with Carthage. Otherwise, Italy would never be free from war as long as Hannibal was alive. End quote. The consuls were caught off guard by this rejection. Quote, you colonists, they said, have dared to address us the consuls in language we cannot bring ourselves to repeat openly in the Senate, for it is not simply a refusal of military obligations, but an open revolt against Rome. You must go back to your respective colonies at once, while your treason is still confined to words, and consult your people. You are not Capuans or Tarentines, but Romans. From Rome you sprang. Whatever duties children owe to their parents, you owe to Rome. If you indeed feel a spark of affection for her, or cherish any memories of your mother country, so you must begin your deliberations afresh. And what you are so now recklessly contemplating means the betrayal of the sovereignty of Rome and the surrender of victory into the hands of Hannibal. End quote. Apparently, the consul's speech had little effect, as there was no response from these representatives. The consul thought it wise to advise the Senate about the lack of support from some of Rome's allies. The consuls advised the Senate that, although some of their allies were wavering in their commitments, many still stayed loyal to Rome. The Senate decided to issue a proclamation naming all of Rome's loyal allies. As to the cities who refused to provide soldiers to Rome, Livy writes that, quote, the Senate forbade all mention of the other colonies who had proved false to the empire. 
The consuls were to ignore their representatives, neither retaining them, nor dismissing them, nor addressing them, but leaving them severely alone. This silent rebuke seemed most in accordance with the dignity of the Roman people. End quote. After this episode, another interesting incident occurred. The loss at Cannae was still burned into the memory of the Roman Senate. Previously, the survivors had been shipped off to remote garrisons in Sicily as punishment. Out of necessity, the surviving cavalry units had been largely spared from the Senate's wrath. But now that the war was beginning to turn against Hannibal, the Senate decided to take action against these surviving cavalry members. They were stripped of their horses that Rome had provided to them. Each soldier was then expected to furnish their own horse, and their tours of duty were also extended. After the Senate concluded these proceedings, the consuls began to make preparation for the summer campaign against Carthage. Money was still an issue, and Livy indicates that the Romans needed to tap into a secret treasury for emergency funds. 550 pounds of gold were given to each of the consuls. An additional 100 pounds of gold would be dispatched to the citadel, still held by the Romans at Tarentum. The remaining gold would be directed to purchasing supplies for the Roman troops in Iberia. After the finances were settled, the Roman consuls turned their attention to Hannibal. Fabius dispatched a letter to Marcellus ordering him to keep Hannibal occupied in northern Apulia while he would launch a surprise attack on Tarentum. Fabius then departed Rome and met Fulvius in Capua. It was decided that Fulvius would march into Lucania in another attempt to divert Hannibal's attention away from Tarentum. In Sicily, Valerius Lavinus was ordered to launch a naval attack against Colonia in Brutium. The plan put Hannibal's overall position in Italy in mortal danger. If Brutium and Lucania fell to the Romans while Hannibal was pinned down in Apulia, Hannibal would almost be completely surrounded. Meanwhile, in northern Apulia, Hannibal had camped near Canusium. Hannibal hoped to convince the town's residents to break their allegiance with Rome. He was still disturbed by the loss of Salapia in the prior year and was hoping to regain the initiative. It was also important to maintain control of the high road through Apulia if at least to hamper Rome's movements further south. When Marcellus learned of Hannibal's presence at Canusium, he immediately left his winter quarters and marched directly to the city. At this point, Hannibal did not want to risk a general engagement and withdrew into a nearby forest. You will remember Hannibal lost a large part of his Numidian contingent at Salapia, so he no longer had an advantage over the Romans in terms of cavalry. Therefore, Hannibal was more inclined to lure Marcellus into a trap rather than risk a general engagement out in the open field. Marcellus quickly followed up on Hannibal's march, and both generals dispatched cavalry and slingers out for skirmishes. As Hannibal exited the forest, he began to set up camp. Marcellus, however, caught up with Hannibal and prevented the Carthaginians from fortifying their camp. Both sides then engaged in a battle that lasted the entire day without any progress being made by either side. At nightfall, both sides retired and set up their respective camps. The next day, Marcellus wasted no time and boldly marched his army onto the field. This time, Hannibal accepted the challenge. After two hours of heavy fighting, the Allied contingent on the Roman right flank began to fall back. Marcellus quickly summoned up a reserve legion but they were unable to make it in time as the Carthaginians threw the entire Roman line into complete disarray. Livy indicates that 2,700 Romans and their allies were killed in the pursuit that followed. Adding to the misery, the Romans also lost six standards and two military tribunes. Marcellus was outraged at the conduct of his army. He ordered the cohorts who had lost their standards to be placed on minimal rations. The soldiers who presided over the lost standards were also stripped of their military cloaks. Marcellus then addressed his army, quote, As matters are, I am devoutly thankful to the heaven that the enemy did not actually attack the camp while you, in your panic, were dashing into the gates and over the rampart. You would most certainly have abandoned your camp in the same wild terror in which you deserted the field. What is the meaning of this panic, this terror? What has suddenly come to you that you should forget who you are and with whom you are fighting? These surely are precisely the same enemies as those whom you spent last summer in defeating and pursuing, who you have been closely following up these last few days, while they fled before you night and day, whom as late as yesterday you prevented from either advancing or encamping, I pass over incidents for which you may possibly take credit to yourselves, and will only mention one circumstance which ought to fill you with shame and remorse. Last night, as you know, you drew off from the field after holding your own against the enemy. How has the situation changed during the night or throughout the day? Have your forces been weakened or his strengthened? But really I do not see myself speaking to my army or to Roman soldiers. 
it is only your bodies and weapons that are the same. Do you imagine if you had the same spirit of Romans that the enemy would have seen your backs or captured a single standard from either maniple or cohort? So far he has prided himself upon the Roman legions he has cut up. You have been the first to confer upon him today the glory of having put a Roman army to flight. End quote. The Roman soldiers beg for Marcellus's forgiveness. Quote, Very well, soldiers, I will make proof of it and lead you to battle tomorrow, so that you may win the pardon you crave as victors rather than the vanquished. End quote. Marcellus also placed the first soldiers who had fled the battle in the first line of the formation. When this was reported to Hannibal, he remarked, quote, Evidently we have to do with an enemy who cannot endure either good fortune or bad. If he is victorious, he follows up the vanquished in fierce pursuit. If he is defeated, he renews the struggle with his conquerors, end quote. And with that, the order to advance was sounded, and the third day of battle began. Livy reports that, quote, the fighting was much hotter than on the previous day. The Carthaginians did their utmost to maintain the prestige they had gained, and the Romans were equally determined to wipe out the disgrace of their defeat, end quote. The battle that followed was a long, inconclusive fight. This time, Hannibal's elite troops, the Iberian infantry, were unable to break through the Roman lines. The Carthaginians, of course, were engaged with emboldened Roman troops that had lost their standards the previous day. At this point, according to Livy, Hannibal brought up his African war elephants in the hope they would cause the usual confusion and panic. At first, the arrival of the elephants had the desired effect, and another route seemed almost a certainty. But a Roman military tribune seized the initiative, and he ordered his men to hurl all of their javelins at the elephants. The counterattack was successful in that it caused a general panic among the elephants. Livy writes that, quote, for these animals cannot be depended upon. The elephants galloped back into the Carthaginian ranks, where they caused much more destruction than they had amongst the enemy. They dashed about much more recklessly and did far greater damage when driven by their fears than when directed by their drivers, end quote. Marcellus seized upon the chaos by ordering his cavalry in, and with that, the Carthaginians retreated back to camp. If Livy is to be believed, the Carthaginians lost 8,000 soldiers, while the Romans lost 3,000. The following night, Hannibal broke camp and marched south. Marcellus wanted to follow up on Hannibal, but was unable to do so because of the high number of casualties he had sustained in three days of fighting. He retired to Venusia for the rest of the summer in order to rest his battered army. Now, you will remember that Fulvius had been dispatched to Lucania. No serious force stood in his way. Facing Rome's wrath, several towns in Lucania surrendered their towns to Fulvius. The consul rewarded these towns that had been previously loyal to Hannibal with care. Their towns and fields would not be razed or seized. As a result of this generosity, a number of other towns in Lucania also switched loyalties to Rome. Even some towns in northern Brutium opened up negotiations with the Romans. Hannibal had learned of this and marched his army into Brutium to prevent a complete collapse. Now free of Marcellus, Hannibal was able to march unopposed through Brutium. By this time, Fabius was already laying siege to Tarentum. It was during this time that Fabius was able to establish secret communications with the commanding officer of a Brutian detachment inside the city's garrison. He offered Fabius easy access near the portion of the wall he guarded. Previously, Hannibal had dispatched a detachment of Brutian troops in order to bolster the garrison at Tarentum. Hannibal had expected the garrison would be sufficient to defend Tarentum, and likely the plan would have succeeded had the commanding officer remain loyal. So Fabius decided a nighttime ruse would work well in this situation. He commanded the troops still held up in the citadel to feign an attack in an effort to divert the garrison's attention away from the wall. The plan worked quite well and he ordered his soldiers to scale the wall near the area where the Brutian commander and his contingent were located. The defectors quickly opened the gates, and by daybreak, Fabius's army smashed their way all the way up to the Forum. Two of the opposition leaders, Nico and Democrates, organized a resistance to the Romans, but in the end, the Romans prevailed. The Tarentines simply were no match against Roman soldiers, and soon fled the streets in sheer terror. Philomenus, who had betrayed the city to Hannibal, was also killed in the ensuing chaos. Fabius was able to seize an enormous quantity of silver and gold. However, religious artifacts and statues were left alone. According to Livy, Fabius, quote, showed a nobler spirit than Marcellus had exhibited in Sicily. He kept his hands off that kind of spoil. When his secretary asked him what he wished to have done with some colossal statues, he ordered them to be left to the Tarentines, who had felt their wrath. The wall which separated the city from the citadel was completely demolished, end quote. Meanwhile, Hannibal had marched all the way down to Colonia, 
Once there, he raised the siege and surrounded the Roman forces. With no chance to escape, the Roman forces surrendered to Hannibal. The victory at Colonia was quickly offset by the news that Tarentum was in mortal danger of falling to Fabius. Hannibal marched his army day and night before camping within five miles of the city. But by that time, Tarentum had already fallen. Hannibal remarked, quote, the Romans too have their Hannibal. We have lost Tarentum by the same practices by which we gained it, end quote. The fact that Fabius had managed to gain possession of Tarentum through treachery was not lost upon Hannibal. The Romans were using the very same tactics that Hannibal had utilized many times before. In any event, Hannibal remained camped near Tarentum for a few days, but then marched back to Metapontum. Hannibal decided to set up a ruse. He sent two townsmen with a letter from Metapontum, stating that the government was prepared to surrender the city to Fabius if he would treat them generously. Fabius accepted the offer and set an arrival date for Metapontum. Hannibal wasted no time and set up an ambush not far away from the city. However, Fabius received an unfavorable omen that cast doubt on the entire operation. Quote, before leaving Tarentum, Fabius consulted the sacred chickens, and on two occasions they gave an unfavorable omen. He also consulted the gods of sacrifice, and after they had inspected the victim, the augurs warned him to be on his guard against plots and ambushes on the part of the enemy. As Fabius did not arrive at the appointed time, more messengers from Metapontum were again sent to Fabius to hasten his movements, but they were promptly arrested. Terrified at the prospect of examination under torture, they disclosed the plot. End quote. This ended any hope for Hannibal to quickly recapture Tarentum. We will continue on with the Second Punic War in the next video.